Hey everybody, welcome back to the CGSP Roundtable. It's been a couple of weeks since we last did this, but uh, we're back after a few weeks and thrilled to, to kind of have these conversations again. I'm joined, as always, by CGSP's Africa editor, Jeronima, joining us from the beautiful island of Mauritius, and Kobus van Staden joining us from Johannesburg, South Africa. Hey guys, how are you today? Nice, hey, thank good. you. Good it's been be a back. while since we've had a chance to get together, and it's been great to be able to uh, pile up a whole bunch of, of topics that we're going to discuss today, in part because one of the reasons we haven't been able to do the roundtable is that a lot of us have been going to different conferences around the world and participating in discussions about China. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed over the past year or so is the interest in China and the global south is gone up a lot. In, in recent months, and there's just a lot of conferences. So we thought we would have a conversation today about some of the topics and the dilemmas and the tensions that are starting to emerge at some of these conferences. I was just at one last week, and I came back, and I was talking to Giro and to Cobus about it, and I want to share those conversations with you guys. So we're going to talk about three things today. Number one, this question about should we even be using the term global south? And this is something that we have been talked about a lot on our shows before, and it comes up in every academic and political discussion about China and the Global South. Then we're going to be talking about the role of China and how to talk about China. This, too, seems to be a pretty difficult question for a lot of people in the U.S. and Europe. And third, we're going to talk about decentering the West from that conversation. So... Um, let's get into it, guys, very quickly, and let me just start by talking a little bit about this question of the global south, and I want to get your take on it, okay? So, uh, and, and I just want to point something out here, that the questions about whether or not we should use the term global south in the conferences that I've gone to and in the media coverage that I have been looking at tends to come from people who live not in the global south, tends to come from people who live in Europe in the US. But this was an FT article that got a lot of attention about this use of the, the word global south, and it should be retired. Now, what they don't say is what word should be used to replace it. Let me just kind of keep the conversation going. Why global south is not a useful term. Again, from Hans Dembowski and... Uh, this is the conversation. Here's an, from, uh, from the Carnegie Endowment. We're seeing, again, notice the from Stuart Patrick and Alexandra Huggins. They don't like the word Global South. Um, let me show you here. This is Noah Smith. He frames it in terms of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> and, and then here we have Stanford University's Michael McFall, former ambassador U.S. ambassador to Russia, he kind of raises this issue that we have all heard at conferences and shouldn't use it, but then what should? And so then there's this word called global majority or some like the developing world. I heard last week they wanted to use emerging markets. Kobus, this is a topic that you have uh, spent quite a bit of time thinking about. Um, Tell us a little bit, what's your first reaction on this, this question, on this debate about whether or not to use the word Global South? Well, for me at the moment, it's just a funny spectacle to see all these all these Global North people being very, very upset, you know? Um, so, so it's, um, you know, so, so that's the kind of theater that I'm, that I'm <laughs> just tracking at the moment. Um, you know, like I, I you know, I don't. I, I've, I'm, you know, on record in the past of, of thinking, like saying that I think the, the term is quite useful. Um, but of course, I live in the global south, so you know, so obviously, it, it looks different from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, here is the thing that happened at this conference I was at last week. And Jeho, this is what I. This is the take I want to get from you because there was a lot of frustration from the people who were from Africa, Asia, and the Americas who feel that this conversation about whether we should use the word global south or not is gaslighting. Because the more time that they spend talking about the political correctness of whether you use this term that, by the way, is used by countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East and elsewhere repeatedly, 
We saw it at the non-alignment movement. We see it in the in the frame reference of South-South cooperation. The India, when it hosted the G20, went endlessly on about how it prioritized the global South. And so there's this sense that the people from the global North countries, white people, tend to be more anxious about this than people where you live. What's your take? It's it's very quite interesting when, uh, as Kobe said, people in the global north take a really huge interest in uh, trying to shape, to reframe that phrase as if it's really bordering them to the point where they feel that it's really something that we need to change. As you pointed out yourself, that when you see people raising that debate, you don't see people from the global south. We don't, you don't see us coming and say we need to change that term. We, it's like it's derogatory. It's a problematic term. It's something that's really not defeating us. Like. At the end, you just kind of wonder what's the problem, and this is some. This is the part where I like to really some get. To the, I don't know if you can get us to the crust of those argument on on why the term global south is a problem for them. Because as long as I've been following that, as go, as long as I've been covering that, and we, we, I've never had that kind of topic or that kind of problem among um, academics or uh, political leaders, intellectually in the global south. When we talk about that, being in Africa, being in Latin America, it never has been a problem in our mind. So when you see that, they're like, what's the problem? What's the argument okay. behind let, that? Let me tell you what, what they're saying the problem is. Number one, they said, what does a country like Indonesia, Mali, um, you know, even Singapore have in common? They're all of different socioeconomic backgrounds. They're all of in different regions. The global south is too broad of a term to, to encompass so many different countries with so much variety in their histories, their backgrounds, their economic status. Now, yeah. oh, go ahead. I have the feeling that's become like more, a, I'd say, a geographical and a number argument. When I, when I say a number argument, because I have the feeling that it's kind of an idea that, because when you show that map earlier, when you see the global south in terms of like the divide and you see the, the, the number of countries, the amount of people, you realize that, yes, in terms of number, in terms of geographical, yes, the global south would really constitute something really in terms of the majority of the populations, which means that the lead of the global south if the global south speaks if someone if a country stands as a as the lead of the global south is going to be as it, it has the legitimacy of, say, of saying i'm talking on behalf of like maybe a, the half of the population more than half of the population because you have china and india and indonesia and you have the country like the drc the nigerias the south africa all together in the same place and that becomes it becomes like more, much more a number argument. Like we want to we we don't want to fail. We don't we don't want to feel like the minority in that debate is the global north. We want to show that the, it's much more complex than that. The global south should be much more nuanced than that. So that's why we'd like we'd prefer emerging because when you use terms like emerging market, developing countries, you now can you can now divide them. You cannot divide different groups. You can say emerging country in one side, developing country in another side uh, poor country or middle middle income countries i don't know in different parts so you can really have different groups but when you have global south i have the feeling that it's much more a fear argument by saying that now we have all the countries in the global south those who are not with us those kinds quote and quote are not with us that going to be going to be against us and the interesting in the map that you show australia is not highlighted in red even though geographically Australia should be in the global south. And when you take into involvement in the global south countries in South Africa, in Southeast Asia, you can like, nah, Australia can be a global south country to a certain extent. In a, in a certain extent. Kobus, let's get your take because one of the participants at a recent conference I went to talked about how while those countries do not have a common geography, even a common socioeconomic status, uh, they almost universally, with very few exceptions, have a common history of being the victims of colonialism. They also have the question of possibilities, that is, access to capital, the access to movement, the passport privileges that, that many of us, you know, with a U.S. and European passport, have no concept of how difficult it is to move around the world. So our possibilities in terms of being able to do things you know, from my point of view, my privilege allows me to think that anything's possible. Your privilege 
or lack of it in a place like South Africa or elsewhere in the global south always puts constraints that you have to deal with. Talk to us a little bit about this concept of possibilities, trying to understand what unites countries from the global south to be able to think of them as a group. Well, you know, kind of in the first place, it is very funny for me, um, you know, to hear Europeans and Americans um, talking about, oh, but the global south makes no, no sense because there's no geographical coherence to it, uh, which is... You know, like, I mean, the UK, for example, in its imperial days, you know, kind of was was crowing about, you know, from the palm to the pine, you know, like that's where the, the British Empire reaches. So no geographical coherence, right? So, you know, kind of, so that's, you know, that, that kind of history of, the history of colonialism and the 20th century history of different forms of laissez-faire imperialism, um, you know, unite the, the global south. I think that's one way of, of looking at it. But also, I think, as you say, there's an issue of access. Um, so, you know, access to finance, to, to international capital, which, you know, kind of as, as we're going through debt crisis after debt crisis, that's, you know, really front and center. Um, but then also just access to global goods, and, you know, kind of like access to be able to travel, being able to to take advantage of, of educational opportunities, for example, to you know to, to simply plan your life the way that you would want to, that that is very very much circumscribed, and I think with and and of course that's a system that um, that benefits the global north, right? Kind of um, because it keeps global south people away, while while also at the same time allowing full reach for global so global north multinationals in in these markets. So of course there are emerging markets, you know, kind of, but they're particularly emerging for companies like Amazon, for example. So you know, kind of, so so in that sense, you know, all all of that is all of that works very efficiently from 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 the the perspective of the global north now that there's now they they i think slowly waking up to the to the reality that the majority of the world's population not so happy with that system yeah um and of course they they are the jewel in the crown of that system right the, like the, the us the uk and so on they are the diamonds in the tiara of that system um and you know now they are increasingly looking like islands um and Especially when are. you look at UN votes. I mean, someone who says the global south does not exist, and then you actually look at the pattern of major UN votes on Ukraine, on Israel, you start to see there is a group yeah. that's there. I mean, there is, exactly. some, there is some consistency that's there. Undeniable, and this is a fact. And what uh, when Kobus was talking about accessibility, I thought about norms, norm uh, setting. When you look at the world today, most of the norm, what we call the rule-based order, and different norms that we use in WTO, in different international organizations, are set by a country in the global north. So today, except now, except that we have in China, we have in the global south a country like China that's a member of the permanent UN Council, but in general, the norm that we are living on, we are living by now, is like are set by a country in the global north. So there's also that sense of access to power, to ability to shape the international system that comes in, that comes in, in, into into effect. So when you're in the global south, you kind of know that. We are the recipient of a system. We are not the actors of a system. Most of the time, when they refer to us, they don't refer to us as an actor. They refer to us as like basically uh, environmental, you know, uh, not environmental, but those people around the circle, but not really at the center of the topic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Let me bring that point up because in the coffee break of one of these conferences that I was at, I spoke with a uh, a, a, a rep, someone from from the Caribbean who was just so frustrated that it's almost like du rigueur at the beginning of every one of these conferences that involves a discussion about China and the global south of the global south, that people come up and say, I'm not comfortable with the term global south, but anyway, we're just going to use it. And, and then someone said in this latest conference that they prefer the word developing country or development. And, uh, and, and I, Giro, I thought that was interesting because development implies a power relationship. Okay. Yeah, Congo is never going to help France develop, right? Yeah. This yeah. is a, there is a hierarchy in development. And in some ways, because the past 70, 80 years of the post-war era, the hierarchy has been the U.S., Europe, and Japan providing aid to 
uh, countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, that that feels very, you know, comfortable and familiar. And so when people express their discomfort with the idea of global south, but their comfort with the words development or developing, there is a power dynamic that's there. And you talked about that, Giro, in terms of being at the center in decision-making. Kobus, yeah. what's your thought on that question of power and language? Well, in the first place, the issue with developing, um, same problem with emerging markets, is that it sets it sets those countries within a kind of a landscape that's essentially uh, like retroactively predetermined by U Europe and the U.S.'s own history, right? So it it, it sets up a narrative in which everyone is trying unsuccessfully, sadly, to 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 catch up to the U.S. and, and Europe. They're always trying; they never will. But you know, oh well, will you know yeah. they they're natural leaders for that reason, right? So um, so then um, you, you know, so in that sense, in the first place, so so like. In, in which world does it really make sense to think of, say, Afghanistan as an emerging market? You know, maybe, but okay, not but in, in any realistic way. In which way, world right? does Singapore, the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, kind of be part of the global south too? That's well, weird they too. are. They and of course China. Are, you know, mm -hmm. kind of are, are the the kind of that's the big elephant in the room, right? Kind of like it's. But the question then becomes like, when do these countries count as developed? And is it really possible still? to make that jump like is it possible to you know for example in, you know like 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 I, I frequently wondered whether south korea maybe singapore are the last countries that made that jump because i don't know that anyone else is um i don't even know that china is going to make that jump um you know and 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 so therefore um that then i think puts developing you know kind of like as you know kind of like it, it really raises a bunch of questions i think around around that concept but but the most important thing is it it's the most important problem is that it presets a direction that these countries are supposedly moving towards, right? Kind of, so they are not they are not making any decisions for their own their own. Oh, they are the only decisions that count are decisions, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of the, the the whether their decisions kind of take them forward along this preset road. Well, right? that yeah. preset, um, you know, so, so, so yeah, yeah, that preset road right. is Westernization, presumably, right? Exactly. I think that's the path. That's what Kobus was saying. I think the path for modernization and the path for develop and, and develop of development has already been has already been set. That's why in that debate of the global south, when the narrative of China, like like global civilization initiative, like we say, there is no one single path to development and everything becomes a problematic. It becoming a problematic narrative because it comes to disturb to disrupt the whole narrative by saying that there is one single path to development that goes through uh, liberal democracy democracy, uh, globalization, open up to economy, straight to this kind of development, this kind of economy. So when China says, no, there's no single path, there is a diversity of history, there is a diversity of cultural background and everything of of different stories that are going to lead to a different path to modernization and to development, that becomes a problem. That's why I was saying that the element of uh, having Global South as a whole group and having one country like China emerging in that sphere is like, we have one. We have someone who can present itself as a leader of a majority of the world and try to switch the norm and become a norm setter. When you mention like country like what Singapore or Singapore or Korea, South Korea can do in the global south, it's simple. They can be developed, but still they don't set the norm of international relation. They don't set the norm. They're still norm followers. They're not norm yeah. setters. Yeah, so, but we're talking about this question of modernization versus westernization. And this was a yeah. topic of conversation, Kobus, that you and I had with Professor Tang Xiaoyang, and that Asia, and I'm going to include Japan and South Korea as well, have modernized but have not westernized. And True. I know that a lot of people, and we've all lived in Japan, yeah. and but a lot of people in the West will say, well, because of Japan's post war history, they most certainly have westernized. And anybody who's lived for five minutes in Japan knows no. they have not westernized. <laughs> and China's Anyone? that same way too. And in and, and South Korea, I would make the same argument. And I can honestly tell you here in Vietnam as well that they are modernizing, but it is not westernizing. Not westernizing, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Go ahead, Kobus. I mean, you know, kind of what they took over is in, kind of in, industrialized you know, forms of globalization, right? Kind of like being, be, becoming kind of through manufacturing and through mass media, becoming drivers of, of globalization, but they're not Western, 
Right. Yeah. They and that's not, why right. modernization, industrialization do not necessarily imply westernization. So I yeah. think one of the getting back to the this question of the term global south and we're going to come to this question of decentering the west. Honestly, the reason why I feel that all of these columnists and these professors and these you know academics of all kinds express this anxiety about we don't like the word global south is because it no longer puts them at the center of the conversation it, and it strips them of the power. That, that's the only thing I can think of, in part because they don't have an answer as to what is the proper way to describe this. And yeah. Well, I would actually differ, actually, because I think in, in a lot of ways, the global south actually puts the West into the center of the conversation, but in a way where the West is everyone's shared problem. Exactly. You know, kind of yeah. Like everyone, exactly. like that's what that's one of the one one of the kind of like the, the organizing is. principles of the global south is all yeah. they all have some kind of unhappy relationship with the West historically and, or current. And, and do you remember exactly. you know? when S. Jashankar, mm -hmm. the external affairs minister from India, had this fantastic quote that said the West likes to privatize the global south's problems but socialize their problems. So why doesn't yeah. everybody? Why aren't they all concerned about Ukraine? Do you remember, Kobus, when we were yeah. in Johannesburg last year and there was this uh, member of, a, of the European Parliament who came, was just, f you know, fuming like red. Thundering. Why, yeah. thundering. Yeah. Why don't these South Africans uh, appreciate what's going on in Ukraine? And I thought of that, I know, and I thought of that Jishankar quote about how the West constantly wants to socialize its problems, but yet when South Africa or Congo or Vietnam yes, like, wants to bring its problems on debt, on health, on inequity, on security, to, on, on security, uh, then the West goes, "Oh, I'm sorry, there's no room on the G20 agenda this time. We'll we'll do it next time." Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. So okay, um, okay. Now I want to move on to our second uh, topic, and this is going to. All of these topics today are all related together because it's talking a little bit about this European US anxiety. And one of the things that I've noticed at various conferences that I've gone to, and I watched from beginning to end the Atlantic Council's uh, two day China and the Global South Conference, and it emerged in a lot of the discussions there, not all, because they had some fantastic speakers there, but particularly in the keynotes about this just this a massive amount of anxiety that the US and Europeans have about China. And what's so interesting is that when you go to South Africa, when you go to Turkey, when you go to Vietnam, uh, they don't have the same perceptions about that. And then I saw this video from last week. There was a discussion between Kishore Mabubani, who is the famous ex-Singaporean UN ambassador or ex-Singapore ambassador to the UN. The UN to the UN and a very well-known commentator on global affairs, uh, has a very kind of pro-China approach to his, his view on those things. He sat down with Orville Schell from the Asia Society. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Orville Schell, he is one of the greats of Sinology. He started in the 70s. Uh, he wrote these amazing books about China to get rich is glorious. He wrote about the Tiananmen Square massacre. He's written about all sorts of things about the history of China. And in many ways, again, we look at him as one of the godfathers of modern day Sinology. And I'm going to play a clip. And it's a little bit of a long clip. I apologize. I actually shortened it down because I couldn't play the full clip. But I want to show you how when the, the, the opening remarks, Kishore kind of laid out why he feels that China is emerging in its rightful place in the world. It's not as threatening as the West sees it. Uh, and then I'm, we're going to pick up the conversation from where uh, Orville Schell responds. And rather than make opening remarks, Schell goes right into these kind of provocative questions, and you'll start to hear it. Let's take a listen now to the discussion between Kishore Mabubani and Orville Schell. Well, it's always a great pleasure to talk with Kishore because it immediately makes me think in ways that I don't normally have to think. Um, the first thought that occurs to me uh, after hearing your remarks is this. You ask, what's the United States' new strategy uh, post-1972, I guess we could call an engagement? I would like to ask you, what do you think China's strategy is? What are they after? Because actually, 
this is a, a dance between two partners. It isn't just up to the United States, as I'm sure you would agree. So what do you think China is after? And if I may ask you a question, what power with great power pretensions adopts wolf warrior diplomacy, antagonizes, I mean, who antagonizes Canada, Sweden, Norway, Australia, India, I mean, I could go on, and why? What's going on here? How is that in the advantage of anybody, much less China? Uh, when you talk about our world and, and how the world sees especially uh, the, what China's goals and strategies are, I, must, I'm, I want you to bear in mind a very important statistic, which is that 12% of the world's population lives in the West, and 88% of the world's population lives outside the West. And let me make one point very clearly and very boldly at the very beginning. How the 12% views China is not how the 88% views China. And so, for example, uh, when you ask about uh, what is China trying to accomplish, and if you want to sort of, try, if I can share with you what I pick up from my conversations with my fellow Asians, with Africans, with Latin Americans, they see that China is trying to come back once again as a strong civilization, which it once used to be. And you know, China, as we, he knows better than I do, he's the China expert. I'm, by the way, I'm not a China expert. <laughs> Let me emphasize that uh, one time. Uh, immediately, I, I'm a China observer. Uh, and of course, we have to be China observers because in Southeast Asia, as you all know, geographically, the power that is going to have the greatest impact on us clearly is China. Just sheer proximity. Just as Latin America will live in the shadow of the United States of America, Southeast Asia has to live in the shadow actually of China and India, I must also emphasize. So our perspective and that of other Africans is that we've seen this civilization for 4,000 years go up, go down, go up, go down. And so the return of China is just part of a long 4,000 year history of dynastic cycles. And when the Chinese civilization goes down, it can go down very, very badly. And I think Orville knows better than any of us that uh, they went through the, one of the worst centuries, the century of humiliation from 1842 to 1949. But it's not normal for the Chinese civilization to underperform for so long. It's much more normal for them to come back after a while. So what we see, therefore, from, let's say, from Southeast Asia is the return of a civilization that we have seen for centuries go up and down. So this is a natural return. Now, so when China tries to claim a place in the world as one of the great powers, is a perfectly natural development. Now, you, you mentioned things, uh, you use words like wolf warrior diplomacy. And what's interesting is that while the term wolf warrior diplomacy is so frequently used in the Anglo-Saxon media, and as you know, the Anglo-Saxon media, let's be very blunt about this, has a very jaundiced view of China, and the rest of the world discounts what the uh, 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 Anglo-Saxon media says about China. What the rest of the world does is to look at what China does and then deal with it. And at the end of the day, you will notice that countries have a choice. Do they want to trade with China or do they not want to trade with China? And if you look at the deeds, China today does far more trade with the rest of the world than the United States does. By the way, we do want to have trade with the United States too. But trade, as you know, is a voluntary activity. But it benefits the countries that do it. So you take a country like Brazil, which is much, much closer to the United States than it is to China. 20 years ago, it took Brazil one year to export $1 billion to China. Today, it takes Brazil 60 hours to export $1 billion to China. So why shouldn't Brazil have a normal trading relationship with China? So you can see, therefore, the point I'm trying to suggest to you is that if you look at many of the countries in the global south, not all, 
at many of the countries in the global south, they're very happy to have normal relations with China, and they have no difficulties. The difficulties have come, as I said, primarily within the United States and China for understandable reasons. This is, no, this is what would happen when you have a great power shift. And I actually think that in some ways, just as what the United States did towards China was predictable, China's responses towards the United States are also predictable. Okay, so that I thought was a, a little bit of a snapshot of it. Interesting that Shell, who again is, I have enormous personal admiration for him. I had a chance to actually meet him last summer when I was in New York at the Asia Society. I have great respect for the work that he's done. But throughout this entire conversation, and I hope you guys will actually take a chance to watch it, uh, he felt off center. He felt like, again, this sense that the that a U.S. academic like him who's been studying China for his whole adult life uh, doesn't have a, have a view of China that the rest of the world can understand. And, and he said, again, it, it was coming very hostile and was very kind of just, you know, that malign China kind of attitude. And one of the things that Kishore Mahbubani said, he said, if you poll Global South leaders and you ask them, would they rather deal with Xi Jinping or Donald Trump? He said, all of them would say I'd rather deal with Xi Jinping. And, and then we've been in a lot of these conferences where we heard the words malign China, where we heard the words of Chinese influence and China's trying to you know, change the rules-based order and all of these different things. And I just, I thought all of this together, Kobus, was very interesting because it feels to me that the US and Europeans have a difficulty talking about China. And there was a, a, a participant in this conference I was in last week from, from Europe who said, you know, Yes, the Chinese, they build a little bit of infrastructure in Africa. And you're just like, wait, what? And dismissing it. And again, it's just, I think there's a real difficulty for a lot of stakeholders in the US and Europe to talk about China in the context of how, again, Kishoma Bubani sees it from the South looking up. Um, I, I think to a certain extent, you know, the, the, the vibe I'm getting, and of course, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not in these rooms and I'm, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm, you know, very marginal from my perspective. But um, the, the vibe I get is is that all of this is coming as a kind of like an unwelcome surprise, I think, to, to, to Western countries. Now to, um, not, not just China's rise, but what, what it implies about the legacy of Western development and Western engagement in, in these, you know, in these regions over the last few decades, you know. Um, the, what, you know, what is emerging is just a kind of a landscape of a lot of undone things, a lot of not un, uh, in, you know kind of unattained goals of non you know kind of non accomplishment, um, you know, and and so so the rise of China isn't just a, a threat to Western current Western preeminence, but it's also a threat, I think, to the idea of Western preeminence as a whole. Um, you know, and 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 there, I think I, I think that idea actually stands on quite weaker legs than than many of them assume. And what comes with it then is this, is this almost this form of like, okay, this is a loaded term, but it's almost it's almost a, a form of fundamentalism. You know, kind of where where you. It's 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 very difficult, for example, right? Kind of for um, for global South stakeholders to have a, a, a kind of a you know expansive conversation where they talk about the failures or the challenges that democracy has suffered, for example, in, in, in the global south, right? Because the default always needs to come back to we need to promote democracy. We can never criticize it. We can never, you know, like there, there's a there's a kind of there's an almost like a, a like a knee clenching around certain kind of talking points, you know, um and, and refusal to admit that 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 in some you know some cases in some kind of complex ways, a lot of a lot of these mechanisms didn't work very well. You know, kind of in, in, in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And and so therefore, you know, I think I think there lies the real heart of it. Because it's not just about the rise of China, because other powers are rising too, right? India is also rising and they're not as worried about India. Um or not yet anyway. Um but but the um you know but but the the, the issue is more is what does all of this mean for the West legacy? I think, yeah. In, in, in these you know, I talked to a think tank analyst in Washington one time and he said, and he boiled it down for me. He said, this is why we're upset. We are 
number one in the world today in terms of absolute power. China wants to be number one, and we're going to do everything in our power to keep that from happening. That was it. It's that simple. That's yeah, the framework. It's not, it's not such a complicated issue, you know. No, it's, no, no. I mean, you know, and they and they they ha they can't envision a world where they're not number one. And I guess when you've been on top, that makes sense. When you've set the rules, when you've done, it's hard to be. I mean, you look at the aging fighters. Look at Tiger Woods right now. I mean, yeah. this guy shouldn't be on the course anymore. He should be. He needs to step away. But he's still out there, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's a little bit of it. Go ahead, Jibo. Yeah, that thing. That what's what you just said? It's really revealing that uh, to 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 the core of the argument, and even what could be said. It really takes me back to a bit of what could be said in the in the previous topic when you talk about the development path. I think it really shows you a certain extent the hypocrisy of the whole development path and the whole goal to achieve because. The idea is like, if we follow that development path, we should get naturally, every each country should get to the level where it becomes powerful. You know, we follow that path, we become powerful, become economically powerful, become naturally, quote unquote, naturally a great power. But the problem with the rise of China is like, China got the advantage of becoming a world economic powerhouse without changing a political system. For long, that path has been sent together, I mean, mixed together. Economic development and political changes, liberal democracy, all needs to come together. But China says and say, we come and I create a divergent, I create a, a model where I can actually get to economic development without changing my political system, without changing my view of the world, without changing myself, without changing quote unquote my identity. So in that regards, now the rise of China becomes the very opposite of all the narrative that have been told us for so many years that's been presented as the truth to development, to human development, to everything that needs to be go to, to, to go that way. So when China raised raise to that level, China become that threat. That threat, even they don't even if they don't acknowledge it, they realize that there is a country out there that's telling us that, you know, you are not the norm. The way you set the world, the way you see the world is not the norm. We can see things differently. And that become very then and endangering for them. And that's what Kobe said. It's become the question like our legacy at the end. Did we for so long, maybe we got it wrong at some point? Especially when you go to Africa, to country in Africa, they say, yes, liberal democracy brought us our freedom but did not bring us development. That's why you have the race of coup d'etat now. When you have the race of coup d'etat, people are saying, yes, we are not against the, 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 the model of democracy, but we're just saying that it did not deliver what you've come to in the 90s and 80s told us it's going to deliver. It's going to deliver development. Now we can see now there is a country that can tell us, you know, you don't need to have liberal democracy to get economic development. And that's all of that. That's why discussing and talking about China becomes a very difficult because it creates a kind of, I believe it creates a kind of a dissonance in a cognitive dissonance within academics, within political leaders in the West. Like, how do we approach that? How do we justify China for so long where it stands right now? So, Kobus, taking into account what Giro just said, which I 100% agree with, there is a and again, I, I, you know, it's easy to kind of poop on the West and to kind of say, well, they're, you know, they're freaking out. They're not at the center. They want to be on top. But at the same time, China um, has done a lot of bad things that are indisputable. The hacking of U.S. intellectual property and the theft of U.S. intellectual property is real. Uh, the aggressive maneuvers in the South China Sea are real. Uh, there are a number of things that are challenging uh, what people would call the rules-based order, which, by the way, for certain countries, has been extraordinarily beneficial. I don't and, want to be a devil advocate here, Eric, but yeah. when you look okay. at the when you look at the West and the US in terms of political change around the world, the, the, okay. the meddling, I, I know where you're going. The, the meddling in people in countries' politics okay. and removing powers. I mean, I mean, come I, on. I mean, I mean I'm, I mean, I'm reading a book about your former on. prime minister, exactly. Patrice Lumumba. Come on. They, can, <laughs> on they that, really but, cannot today come and say, you know, because they are doing that. I mean. But that, they I are. Someone said, but, someone said, I remember just, just digressing. Someone said, how do you consider North Korea being a danger when North Korea never overthrown any government elsewhere in the world? When you look at the US, which basically either funded rebellion groups, either funded, I don't know, rebellion somewhere, overthrow powers, like 
was the most dangerous for the world world sure. orders today. So yeah, but the, but the American response would be that the global public goods that the U.S. has brought over the past half century have made it safer for ships to sail through the Straits of Hormuz, through the through the South China Sea. They've they've made it possible that countries like Japan. South Korea uh, have not had to to remilitarize in any way to confront China, North Korea, and so forth because the U.S. presence. Again, just trying to put some balance there that it, it is complicated. But but yeah. Kobus, I mean, again, this this sense of anxiety that you see coming from the U.S. and Europe of being displaced and of not knowing and having a difficulty about talking about China outside of the security realm, picking up what Kishore Mabubani said, that the way that the 12% talk about China is very different than the way the 88 other percent do. Um, is there any legitimacy to the US-European anxiety? Um, I, I think, I th you know, kind of like I share some some of the concerns, um, but I think they are they need to be you know, one needs to complicate this this conversation a lot because what what is frequently, what is frequently kind of um, the the way it's frequently framed, right? Kind of is that is that the U.S. you know the, that the U.S. is Achilles' heel is its own goodness, right? Kind of that it's it's in its insistence on democracy, its insistence on human rights in the, throughout the rest of the world. That is what ta China is now targeting, and that is that is the kind of like these these illiberal governments in the in the in the global south, uh, you know, they, they just want to throw democracy away, and China's now giving them, and you know, kind of a, a pretext to do it, and you know, kind of, and, and the U.S. is just trying to fight for the greater good, which, sure, you know, kind of that's that's kind of like that's half of a story, right? The other half of the story, and I think in this case, for example, like LGBT issues provides a very interesting lens, is that yes, on the one hand, the the U.S. particularly and Europe to a certain extent. Is are they are the kind of intellectual champions and intellectual entrepreneurs of of LGBT rights as we know it in the modern world and the and the kind of championing of them. However, they are also the center. The West is also the center of anti-LGBT, you know, kind of campaigning. You know, the, the 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 law the law by you know kind of put in by Uganda recently and the one in Ghana are very fundamentally shaped by U.S. thought leadership, particularly coming from the evangelical world. So, you know, kind of, so, so in that sense, in a similar way, you see very similar kind of discussion around ESG, right? Kind of like where China, you know, as, as, as one, there was one U.S. Uh, US politician in the house, I think, um, who was, was like literally saying that China essentially wants to destroy the environment and, you know, kind of and uses any opportunity to do it, you know? Which are, but also, um, you, you know, kind of. So, so, so you see, you see that kind of conversation as well. The, the, the West is just trying to impose these kind of good norms, and China is destroying them. But when you look at, for example, this great, great um, investigation that we featured a while ago in our work, looking at how wood in Equatorial Guinea gets exported to China and then end up in Home Depot in, in the U.S. What one sees is the exploitation of, of, of the global south, particularly highly corrupt, very vulnerable parts of the global south, like Equatorial Guinea, is a joint project between the West and China. And it fits into a single economic job, you know, kind of which is putting doors for middle class Americans in Home Depot. That is the project that, that Africa, China, and the US are involved in in this particular case. And in that case, so so it's not so easy, right? Kind of to just to just be like, oh, China, huge, huge exploiter, West somehow not. You know, like particularly in a moment when we know that West US, like that China US economic relations are very, very entangled you know so so there's no that, like that that is narrative crafting it's not it's not based on any kind of real real kind of like structural analysis of how things work and in that process one has to go back to this issue of the developing world right kind of because developing essentially puts you on a timeline right kind of like puts you it puts you in you know kind of at the back of of a, a long progress where the us and china are ahead of you right as, as a developing country family. But what what we what the Equatorial Guinea situation shows is that so that Africa being this kind of site of exploitation is its contemporary role, right? That isn't of some role that's stuck in the past. This is Africa's current role, right? Yeah. And and that role is part of. 
China and the U.S.'s current economic projects, right? So, so Africa has a, a current contemporary structural position in, you know, kind of in the global economy that isn't old or isn't kind of somehow less left in the past. It's very, very up to the up to date, yeah. um, you know, and and that is what the global South addresses in some kind of like inchoate way, and I think that is partly why it makes Western countries so nervous. And so let me just just for your benefit here, we're bringing up the Environmental Investigation Agency report that Cobus referenced. Uh, it's an absolutely fantastic report, but it does it does show those linkages. And again, one of the findings in the report was how Home Depot is not managing its supply chain, not actually investing the resources. And Giraud, this is something you know also well yeah. from the cobalt supply chain. And yet the focus oftentimes is again on China. And so again, uh, one of the things that came up in in these conferences that that again you you and all we've all been to is the fact the difficulty that Western European and U.S. stakeholders have in decentering themselves, and it's this idea that they still remain at the center of the conversation. And so, for example, at a conference that was presumably about the global South, uh, we had an hour and a half presentation about the U.S. elections implying that the U.S. elections, everybody around the world must be interested in this. Now, of course, the U.S. elections are incredibly important. Uh, it's going to impact a lot of people. But it was just, to me, an interesting choice thematically in the conference that uh, presumably something about the rest of the world would have a seminar on U.S. elections. And you see this constantly where uh, Europeans and Americans who've spent very little time in developing countries have very strong views. And I find that also something that's just, again, just interesting. Giro, what's your thought on this? Uh, it's really take me to the to the comment I've made before when we talk about the global stuff in terms of norm setters, the norm those create the norms, and I think it's becoming very much more dif difficult today for uh, the West to seal the world uh, beyond them, be in in through a through a lens where they are not at the center of the subject, where they are not the center in the room, where they di di dictate the direction where we have to have the discussion, how we need to talk about that, and it's really becoming much more difficult for them, and it's becoming as as if they've they're trying to remain relevant in a world that's uh, that is changing. In a world where voice are voice are now raising to a new, to, to new norms, in a world where people are saying that there is now new path to different ways to different direction that we can take, it's really becoming difficult for them to exist in a world where for so many years, may almost centuries, they've been the truth. They've been saying what we say is the truth. What we say is the public good. What we say this is how it should go. This is how it should happen. So. When now there you find yourself in a world where you have academic, intellectual, political in the global south, in Africa, and telling you, no, I think that we can see things differently. We can perceive things differently. We can now cohabitate in the world where I have a different view of you, but we can still work together. That becomes difficult. And it becomes much more difficult for them but because for many years, we are like, it's, it's, it took me back a bit like in Rome, where Rome is the civilized world. Outside Rome, all of you are barbaric. You need to be civilized by Rome. We, so you being civilized by Rome, you it means you adopting, approaching norm, Western-centered norm, the way we see world and we see, the way we see life. And in that world where now things are changing, where those norms are cracking up, it's, it's a different place. It reminds me that Naledi Pando comments what she what she said few few weeks back in um, in um, in Carnegie Endowment Center. So it really shows you that yes, in that space, it's becoming for them difficult. To say now I'm not in the center of the topic. How do I discuss those topic? How do I approach those discussion where now I've bold people telling me. Yes, this is your point of view, but we don't share the same point of view. We don't share the same argument. And we think that there is a different path to what we want to get. So that's becoming difficult for yeah. them. Kobus, I'm going to give you the last word. And, you know, as an American, I see these contradictions, I think, in some ways, maybe more acutely than others do, just because I spend more time in the U.S. And on the one hand, you hear this rhetoric still of American exceptionalism and that everybody wants to be like us and that you hear all the time 
that the president of the United States is the leader of the free world. The free rule. And, yeah. Remember that, you know, in yeah. which I think if you tell somebody in the Netherlands that the U.S. president <laughs> is somehow their leader, they're going to just laugh at you or in, or in Japan or in Singapore or yeah. elsewhere that our democracy is better than everybody else's. And at the same time, on both left and right in the United States, you see this really big drive towards isolationism, to, uh, to pull back from free trade, to pull back from international aid, to pull back from, from engagement. One of the things right now is that, you know, I see here in Vietnam, and I think where you are too, there's no Americans. You don't, I mean, you don't see, Americans don't have a lot of vacation time, so they can't travel far. So that's why they end up going to Canada or to Mexico or to on package trips to Europe. Uh, at the same time, there's also just a lack of curiosity about the world. And one of the other things that I see is that when I'm back in the US is that you have to actively work hard. I mean, really hard to break out of the information bubble to get news about the rest of the world. It is alarming how closed off intellectually so much of the US is and to some extent Europe is. And so when it comes to thinking about China and also thinking about the rest of the world, this decentering becomes really challenging. Kobus, give your final reflections on not only this, but again, the conversation we've had today. Um, I think this is a really com complicated moment, right? Kind of because on the one hand, um, we have this political drive towards towards you know kind of isolationism in different kinds of ways but at the same time as we've been discussing there's a lot of energy and angst and and resources being thrown at maintaining european kind of norm leadership and uh, not european like western norm leadership um th throughout the world right and also we're at a moment where it's not like western capital is somehow staying at home right kind of like western capital is still transnationally very active um, so even as the politics in the West is calling for is, is calling for all of this kind of withdrawing and small worldism and so on, at the same time there is you know kind of de facto there's still a, a, a very strong drive from Western power for for it to be the the kind of default global number one, um, and so so both of those things are happening at the same time, um, and you know kind of. W w it, it all then plays out in, in, in very kind of contradictory ways. Um, and I think in lots of ways, quite revealing ways. What's the question is, you know, like Kishore Mahabani was saying that, you know, kind of that the 12% of the global North look at China in this one particular way, and then the 88% look at them in, in a completely different way. I don't know that I 100% agree with him, because if one just looks at, for example, the way that the, the wave after wave of moral panic in a country like Nigeria, for example, about Chinese loans and the Chinese mm. debt trap, when we know that, that Chinese debt makes up only 6% of Nigeria's total debt, and Nigeria has huge, huge problems with Western-held private debt that are very, very, with very high interest rates. Right? But is that because That's of the Chinese, or is that because of just the fear of foreign occupation given their history? Well, I think I think what that that is I see it as a as, as a as a case study of how still discursively dominant Western thinking is, right? Mm, kind true. of Western Western framing of the issue is, right? right. Because because yeah. why isn't Nigeria talking about a Western debt trap? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Right? Kind of like no, and, where and, is where you know this even no, no, becomes, this is you know, so funny that. because uh, at one of my conferences there was a uh, I have to be very careful because this was all under Chatham House rules, but there was a Western finance official there who talked about uh, debt in Africa and mentioned Chinese loans, okay, and mentioned multilateral loans and said that Chinese loans and the opacity of the deals are the problem, but never once mentioned Eurobond and private creditor debt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like there's there's so much that's unsaid or unsayable in, in kind of in, in Western discourse about China Africa relations. Um, you know, and 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 that I think unless global south people and particularly I think Africans start saying these things, they will remain that this 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 discourse will remain this kind of weird like double speak 
nonsense that we have at the moment you know kind of i think i think you know in a, in a lot of you know kind of like we, we need to get real about what what the what the the, the structural position of global south countries are right okay. um and and the kind of like plus and minuses that china holds for them because it's not it's 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 not all it's not all terrible but it's certainly not all good you know yeah. um so you know um but then also you know particularly also just being being clear about about what being africa and the world entails I think that would be a big step forward. Okay. That's what sure. we are here. Very, very quick, what, uh, yeah. very quick. I want to make sure you get a, a final comment. Yes, that's why we are here. That's my mind. That's why the China Global South is here. We want to raise that voice from the Global South. We started with China's China Africa project to raise that voice of Africa in the world to say it's time for us to really raise those topics, really to have to have those conversations on our own, on our term, telling you what we see, how we see things, how things are moving. It's not about you telling us anymore about things that's happening in our country. It's time for us to tell you really what we see and what things are happening in our countries. And that's why the big push that we're doing at the China Global South Project is the in-language content that we're producing, uh, not only in French and Arabic. And Giro, I want you to tell everybody about what we're doing in French, but also in Bahasa, in Kiswahili, in Igbo, in Hausa, and so many other local languages across Africa that we're actually uh, producing content and distributing content to millions of people across the, those regions to have those conversations independent of the prevailing Western uh, discourses, which as Kishore Mabubani said, I don't agree with everything he says, but the prevailing Anglo-Saxon narrative on China is certainly filtered. Yeah. There's there's yeah. no, I mean, there's I mean, there is some balance. There's some great reporters, don't get me wrong, but the the sweeping narratives. Now tell us a little bit very quickly before we go about the work you're doing at Projet Afrique Chine and what people can uh, can find on the site. Yes, in Project Afrique, Shin, as you see, as you see on your screen, we really cover what China does in Africa, but it, we do that, we do and that, we do it in French, where we noticed there was a lot of, uh, when you talk about China, Africa, it was most of in English. Now we really have that content in French where you can come and see different analysis that we produce on different issues around China and Africa in French. We have a podcast, we have a newsletter. Every week you receive twice newsletter on different, uh, twice and uh, two newsletter every Tuesday and Friday where we talk different issue. We cover a, a wide range of topic, a wide range of issues around that China, Africa, and in that space where you have mining stories, economic stories, human rights stories, all kind of geopolitical issues from an African perspective where we tend sometimes we give you uh, hints and tips by saying from an African perspective that doesn't work and everything and we reproduce really great analysis from different people from different contributors I think you're gonna come in and you're gonna enjoy it if you really want a media that covers China in Africa in French you really want to follow please it's really it. fantastic it, it, again I cannot recommend it enough and if you want to sign up for Jeho's newsletter that goes out on Tuesdays and Fridays just go ahead and put your email right there at the top of the page if you speak French. And of course, if you want to follow all the great work that we're doing in English as well every day, uh, the team is just, it's so cool. I mean, it's just, I'm so proud of everything that we're doing. And and again, this there's no site like this. There's no service like this. And here's the great videos that Giro is doing and the team is doing. I also, we just launched this new section called CGSP in the news where we're showing all of the uh, media appearances that the team is making from Giro in Jenga, also Kobus and Johnny. Uh, in Swahili, in, in, in Kuyu. Kuyu. Yes, there yeah. we go. In, in all the different languages, also in French as well. So uh, and you can see the great impact. And then here's the, the podcast that Kobus and I have been doing together for going on 14 years now. Kobus, do you feel old? Yes, it's really old. <laughs> and then also just want to give, if you subscribe to us, I just give you a sneak peek of what you'll get every day. Um, this is the newsletter that goes out every single day. I mean, this is a beast of a newsletter. This is a daily intelligence report. Uh, we serve about 25 governments around the world, scholars, academics, universities. Uh, this is hardcore. So if you're interested in following what China's doing with agenda-free, nonpartisan news and information, this is what you'll get every single day, Monday to Friday, in your inbox. Uh, Kobus, Barry, the you know, in Jenga, all of us are working on it. Giro's contributions there as well. And so uh, so this is it. So if you want to, you know, join our conversation, just go to ChinaGlobalSouth.com. And if you would like to subscribe, all you have to do is go to ChinaGlobalSouth.com 
to subscribe. So, okay, guys, let's leave the conversation there. A lot of fun for us to get together. Hopefully, it's not going to take us three or four weeks to get together yeah. again. Just want to thank you both, Jiro Nima in Mauritius and Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, and I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. Until the next CGSP Roundtable, thanks so much for watching. See you next time. See you guys. Bye-bye.